Uh, so first of all, thanks for everyone to, to be here today. Uh, and a special thanks to Valérie, who actually uh, was kind enough to read my PhD before I defined it, and he even was nice enough to say good things about it. So, thanks. <laughs> I mean, good for me, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, thanks everyone for being here. So today I'd like to present you a paper I, uh, that got accepted at uh, IEEE Access uh, Journal, which is, that's titled Towards a Better Understanding of Mobile Users' Behavior, a Web Session Repair Scheme. So first of all, let me <clears throat> tell you a bit about the context of this project. Basically, the Warp Drive Mobile project is um, an Android app developed by a consortium of uh, companies and research agencies in Japan that is doing data collection for security analysis and security research purposes. Basically, uh, you volunteering users are going to install this uh, Android app on their mobile phones, and it's going to uh, monitor their mobile phone activities being uh, web accesses, application usage, and these kind of things. And, uh, so, for, uh, among the features collected in among the, um, the data collected in by the sensor, you have the web accesses made by either the Chrome uh, web browser and uh, other applications using the custom tabs technology from Android. You'll have um, which application, so which uh, Android apps have been installed or removed from the phone. Uh, which uh, application is in the foreground of the phone at time of connection. And uh, in, uh, regarding SMSs, when you receive an SMS, if in the text there is a link, we're going to collect only the link of the SMS, not the rest of the text in the message. Um, the thing is that this sensor relies on the Android Accessibility Service, which mostly relies on information that is shown on the screen, right? Everything that is visible to the user is usually accessible by the accessibility service. Um, uh, there are some information that's not visible to the, to the mobile phone user that is still accessible to the accessibility service, but it's very minor. But um, so sometimes when you collect information, especially regarding web accesses, you are going to miss, for instance, the URL, which URL was uh, shown uh, on the screen because maybe the, 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 the app doesn't allow for the display of the, of the URL. Or you might miss uh, one very important parameter that I have shown here, which is the tab number, which is the identifier of the tab uh, in which the web access has been made. Uh, sorry. Um, and also, one a few uh, another reason why the data collection might be incomplete is because uh, you have privacy requirement. For instance, by default, we do not collect information related to um, mail uh, services like Gmail. We do not collect accesses made to bank uh, to bank websites in order to preserve to preserve sorry uh, um, the, the, the the privacy of the end user. Sometimes, because it's a mobile phone, you might not have uh, a perfect collection process. Like you might have not uh, uh, enough computing power, it the app, the sensor may lag, or this kind of thing. Hence, leading to an incomplete data collection. Uh, the thing is, when you don't have a complete collection process, basically you will have uh, incomplete web browsing sessions. Um, in this work, basically, uh, in this work, we consider web browsing sessions as just se uh, sequences of URL accesses. So the user accesses one URL after another, right? Which is default web browsing behavior. The thing is, each, as I said earlier, each access is tied to a tab number. So if you have an entry in your records that misses the tab number, you don't know to which browsing session this particular access has been made. Uh, in the paper, we call that an off-run entry because it just it's standing alone, and you don't know to which more global browsing session it belongs to. Uh, 
And uh, one of the consequences of those session of those elements not having a web browsing session is that you are going to miss security incidents because you cannot fully reconstruct the web browsing session. I will give you clear, uh, concrete examples of the security incident at the at the end of this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to present you two papers that are related to the work uh, I have done in this. Uh, uh, in, in, in this paper. First is, <clears throat> how do users reach malicious run, which is a paper from my boss, Takeshi Takahashi. And basically, he had a similar uh, the, um, data collection process, but instead of being on mobile session, on mobile phones, it was on uh, directly on the, on the desktop and laptop uh, computers using a Chrome extension, basically. It would collect uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, it would collect the web accesses, the time number, the refer ID, because uh, when you use Chrome extensions, you can know from which URL you come and what kind of actions created if, if it's a, a click that created a new tab and this kind of thing. So you have much more information available to you when you use uh, the PC version, basically. Uh, and what they did is to analyze the entry points of attackers. And one of the findings was that Basically, people uh, are bookmarking malicious websites. Uh, okay, I'm uh, sorry, we got attacked by a desk. It's a real security team with traps here. And so every uh, manga reading websites, adult websites, these kind of things, all of them often have some sort of malware embedded, and people are going to bookmark those websites. So basically, that's the one of the most common way they got infected. Uh, the second paper actually is um, more similar to what we did in that they collected uh, networking logs from a mobile um, uh, mobile network provider and they have uh, uh, connected basically the web browsing sessions from the mobile networks they had and they have uh, created um, a, log um, a logistic regression classifier that would help predicting when uh, in the time frame in which a user was likely to be exposed to malicious contacts, basically. So this is the, the, the work that was already existing. The thing is, we could not really um, do uh, the same thing because first of all, the data, the, the data set is not complete as opposed to the data set from Takash San or the data set from the mobile carrier. This data set is fairly coherent, consistent, and didn't, and they didn't really suffer from any collection issues. The second thing is, uh, as opposed to, for instance, the data set using the Chrome extensions, where you have a lot of API calls to help you understand the construction of the data set, I have nothing like that. I have raw data, which sometimes is incomplete, and I have no tools to actually uh, explore it fairly easily. So, the, um, basically, uh, I asked myself a couple of questions. First, can we repair the data set to make it usable from research, for research uh, purposes? Uh, can we evaluate the quality of the reconstruction? Because if I reconstruct the data set, I have to prove that I did a good job, which is not inherently the case, right? Like, you can't just assume that your reconstruction was good. And finally, can, I, can we prove that the data we reconstructed and re or repaired is actually usable for security purposes because so far, if I don't do that, I haven't proven the usefulness of my uh, first two questions. So, first of all, reconstructing a, web, reconstructing a web sessions. What does it mean? So, using tab number, basically, you will have one web browsing session. I'm sorry, it's a bit might be a bit small, but so you have the the purpose is to find um, where to insert. The, the orphan entry into the web browsing session. If you only have one, it's fairly easy. You know where to insert it. But the question is, when you have multiple sessions that may contain your uh, orphan entry, where do you put it in? Because it can only fit one. It can't fit two different web browsing sessions. So to do that, we decided to use, to define a likeliness score for the insertion of uh, the, the entry. Basically, you, you know, on the top of the fraction, you are using the similarity between URLs. Like you, you take your own URL and you compare it with the neighbor 
the previous neighbor and the next neighbor in the potential web browsing session. So the, this, the more likely, the, the more similar the URLs are, the more likely we assume that the, this entry would fit in the session. Uh, on the denominator of the fraction, it, it's the delta between the accesses that have been made. Basically, the further apart the, access, the accesses are being made, the less, the least likely they are to be made. Uh, <clears throat> so how, uh, how did we reconstruct the, this web browsing session? So first of all, you select, well, you, say, you take each orphan entry, you take all the possible sessions they may fit in uh, according to some criteria I'm going to skip for today. Obviously, you insert the, 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 the orphan entry chronologically inside the, the web browsing session. The good news is that because the timestamp is generated by the sensor and, and is not an external data collected, I never had any issue with the, 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 the timestamp collection. Similarly, if the URL was empty, I just dropped the, the, the entry. I never considered it because I have nowhere to insert it, basically. You compute the score, and then you just keep the session with the best score. Finally, you just, uh, I, I decided also to split the session again post-insertions because I noticed that sometimes some URLs would come back. Typically, uh, if you can see them, it's a bit uh, the about blank or search or type web addresses. You know those are the home page. Uh, it's not a URL, but it's the home page text you have when you go when you press the home button. You know on your Chrome browser or these kind of things. So the assumption was okay. If we see this kind of uh, text in the URLs, it means that the user came back and started a new web uh, a, a new browsing session. Um, uh, yeah, so once the reconstruction was done, I had to evaluate the quality of the data uh, of the data I ju had just prepared. So the thing is like, there are a few questions actually that I had to make some hypothesis on for the, for the evaluation. First of all, is the, the, the session I have selected for the reconstruction, is it, okay, it is the best one, but is it the right one, was it? Uh, is it the correct answer? Because as I said before, some sessions are skipped, they are, they are not collected. So if you, if you insert, you, you may sometimes not have the right answer available to you, and yet you still make a choice. So definitely this is something you have at least to consider and discuss prior to re the reconstruction process. Uh, the second question was, is the machine learning model suitable for this task? Because like there are many options available. So if we make the choice to go for a machine learning model, is it, uh, can, we, can we discuss that? Is it, is it a suited approach? And what are the limitations of evaluating the quality of the reconstruction using a machine learning model? So as for the, the usage of a machine learning model, what we hope for this model is to learn the characteristic of the correctly inserted entry inside the web browsing session. So we have um, to consider what is the training data, because so far I have not presented any ground truth for which I would that, we, that I would use to train my machine learning model. And also I have to consider multiple models for this, for this task, right? So as for the creation of the training data, basically, First, I have reconstructed my whole data set. Every orphan entry has, uh, has found um, a browsing session. So basically, I will select some uh, browsing session I have reconstructed, and I will manually look through it, through them, to see if each entry that has been inserted inside is actually inserted at the right place. For instance, um, it took me a couple of hours of manual work to just check the URLs before the, the URL of the orphan entry, what kind of website it is. Like, is it, on, I had automotive websites and check the neighbors because sometimes you go from a, a motorbike website, you move to a Formula One website and this kind of thing. So it makes sense. I mean, from an expert's point of view, okay, we are still in the same topic. Like we are in the automoto, uh, automoto sports and this kind of thing. So this was my whole work 
just to create the training data is to look at the context, is to look, um, is to check uh, using Google and other uh, search engines. Okay, what kind of, what is the topic? What are the keywords? Uh, is it coherent to have this entry inserted in this session? Uh, we evaluated multiple uh, uh, multiple models for the task. So I will admit, because this was my first research work in machine learning model, I decided to use a wide panel of machine learning models in order just to get a hand on what is relevant, what gives good results, etc., etc., etc. And also, I uh, I evaluated two things, which is the removal of outliers in the data set that may cause some problem during the training, and the removal of uh, um, of features that did not really contribute to uh, the performance of the machine learning model. <clears throat> As you can see, so there uh, we we divided. The features into two types: the similar similarity features, which are um, the the text similarity feature, like the Jacquard index, the the Levenstein distance, distance. Uh, also the temporal um, similarities, you know, the delta before and after the the, the neighbors with the, the considered entry, and we also consider technical features that are raw attributes collected by the sensor. So you have, um, oh, sorry, there is the score, which I will agree is co uh, correlated to the previous uh, features, but I still decided to keep it. And um, also continue, continue the access type. So as a reminder, the access type, you have either the Chrome browser, which means we also skipped a lot of browser. For, I personally use, uh, uh, often use the Adblock web browser to avoid a lot of pop-ups when I use my mobile phone. This browser would be skipped by the sensor. But if you use the Chrome Web Browser, you will have it. And you have custom tabs. If you don't know custom tabs, is um, a feature from the Android service that allows you to implement a web browsing uh, page without having you know, all the, the, the Google Chrome interface. It's just like, instead of coding your whole uh, front end of an API to request data, you just, oh, I'm just going to collect the, a web page and use the custom tabs to hide something and pretend that it's a full part of my um, uh, of my app. You often have that when you open a link in some apps where you see that it opens a new page, uh, and it's I think it's not really a web it's not a browsing web browser page, but it's you are still inside the scope of the app basically. It's something like that. Uh, and um, when we did a feature. Um, yeah, when we did feature removal for the contribution, basically only two features had been removed. Those were the features related to, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> two features I didn't introduce before, apologies. So you have the type of threat that has been detected by you know, Google self browsing. Uh, so you have uh, social engineering, malware, and unwanted software. Those are the th uh, three different, or uh, legitimate, obviously. But so you have three different types of threats that can be detected by Google self browsing. And when we removed the, the, the uncontributing features, uh, basically only the features related to the security aspect of the data set have been removed from uh, by, 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 the, by the feature removal uh, algorithm. Just to present you some, uh, some results, basically the best performing uh, um, Best performing model where the K, uh, K, and, uh, K, and, uh, K nearest neighbors uh, uh, classifier and the, uh, gra the X gradient boosting classifier. Um, it was requested for me to compare basically the, the data with and without upsampling, uh, upsampling because my training data was widely unbalanced. That is often happen when you do manual data collection, you have a, a lot of unbalanced data. And I use SMOT to correct the balance of the between both classes. So something funny I noticed, but I yet have to investigate the reason why, is for the first uh, the SVM, the logistic regression, and the SGD algorithm. When you use when you don't use SMOT, basically when you have a, a, a big unbalance between classes, basically you have a better performance because simply put. Uh, 
you will have so many so little errors in the classification because your minority class is barely seen and every time you miss it basically okay i just missed it but my performance increases but when you do um when you do balance uh when you do class uh, upsampling basically the performance for those three algorithms uh, decreases because you have more or less a one-to-one -one ratio between uh, between both classes so the performance decreases but Starting from the random forest and the next ones, you can see that the, the performance without, uh, without smoke, so without class upsampling, is actually worse than with upsampling. So I'm not familiar enough uh, with those algorithms to give uh, a good intuition uh, of why, but um, I'm, still look, I'm, I'm still looking into it, into the, work, the inner workings of each uh, model classifier to understand why we have this switch in performance between upsampling and no upsampling. Um, as you can see, so the best performing uh, classifiers are both a, K the, a combination of KNN and gradient boosting. And actually, it's the so the pruned uh, data set <coughs> is the data set where we remove useless features. The thing is, if you look at the full, um, the full data set with no outlier removal nor feature selection, you have only a, a performance difference of 0.2%. So this is very, uh, you, you can neglect the, the, the performance, the difference in performance. And therefore what we decided for the paper is to keep the full data set for the analysis because we thought that maybe, maybe it's just some overfitting to the, to the data set without, um, uh, with the class, uh, feature removal. So we decided to keep the full features just in case uh, we have a bigger data set later so we don't have uh, as much overfitting. But this is so tight, so it's very hard to, to draw the line. Regarding the limitation of this whole reconstruction, basically, for, first of all, correct and incorrect is just a partial view of the data set. As I said before, sometimes we are going to actively skip data collection. Sometimes we will involuntarily skip some uh, also some uh, web accesses, meaning that we won't have the web sessions to actually insert the correct one. So um, you, it, would, uh, it would be wise to consider a broader and a better definition of correct and incorrect, maybe um, that to give a better representation of the data that we have repaired. As I have said before, we have used a splitting, uh, we have split the web loading session once they have been reconstructed using you new know, start phrasing like, please type a new address. Meaning that a session, as you will see later, and we have sessions that can last hours. Obviously, that's not realistic. No one is using his mobile phone for seven hours in a row with no breaks or whatever. That's not realistic when I see people laughing in the back. Uh, for the average user, it's not a realistic assumption. Uh, also, the definition of malicious content can, can be discussed because in this case, we have used Google Safe Browsing for the labeling of the malicious data. The thing is, there are multiple papers that have already pointed out the limitations of Google Safe Browsing itself, the delays and the modification that happen in the blacklist and the whitelist. So definitely, this is not a perfect definition, and we could combine that with virus total. One issue we have in our case is because virus total is a permanent record of the entry you have, you cannot give virus total the full URLs you have collected because you might have identified the, the data inside and therefore we would breach, uh, I mean it's forbidden by the law, simply put. What I did though is uh, we are allowed to put the, 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 the primary domain and the TLD in the web virus total. The, that way you can investigate the website without investigating or leaking private information. Um, Finally, as for the volume of the data set, um, we had the data set has been creating between uh, 2019 and 2020 ish, or uh, I used 12 months of data. We had around 2,000 users, and out of those 2,000 users, only 107 
had data that was flagged by Google Search Browsing. It's a 5% rate, which is a bit lower than other papers I have presented in the related work, which reach around 10%. So it's slightly lower, but at the same time, our users, um, one thing we know for sure is that our users are much more unique in the fact that they have installed an app on their own smartphone. So it's less likely, and considering the number of users, it's less likely you have like bots farming, you know, those uh, using uh, smartphone emulations and this kind of thing. So we, we felt that uh, these 107 users in the data set was good enough to, to run the data analysis that I, that I am going to present now. So overall, we felt that the data set was good uh, to was good enough to be to be processed. So once we have once we have reconstructed the data, we did some exploratory analysis of the data we have reconstructed. So that's the third question: Is my data my, my data useful for security research purposes? So first of all, we did some analysis of the length uh, of the session. So we compared three criteria: the average length in terms of number of entries. The average duration, so from start to be to end, and also the average the average and median time for the transition from one URL to another. As you can see, between uh, malicious and legitimate sessions, the average uh, the average uh, number of entries is quite uh, large. We have you have factor nine mean that means that in average, um, a malicious session has between one and two entries inside the web session itself, uh, while legitimate sessions have much more entries inside because like you have just browsed more pages uh, on the internet, basically. Um, the reason why I chose to not limit myself to only the average of, uh, uh, and to consider the median, because if you look at the duration, for instance, the duration between, uh, First of all, the, the difference in average duration between malicious, malicious sessions and legitimate sessions is, is between two and three for a factor. But the thing is, it's hours. So that means in the data, you have a lot of outliers. You have a lot of entry points that are going to increase widely the, the average duration of your, uh, of your session. And I think everyone can agree that 34 hours or 84 hours is not a realistic uh, duration for web browsing session, which basically leads back to the splitting of the session and some limitation or some hypothesis. We did not to use any chronology like duration to split the session by force. Similarly, the average transition, um, the, the number of transition is slightly better in terms of time. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, slightly better of time in terms of factor, because like both uh, malicious session and uh, legitimate session had the same number, but again, in average, you have uh, a magnitude of hours, while on median, you have a magnitude of seconds between pages, which again makes sense because it's like, it's quite unlikely that you are going to spend seven hours on the same web page before switching to another one. So that definitely, so what it shows and what uh, we pointed out is that the way the data set itself, the way it is constructed, is skewed and should, and we should reconsider an extra pre processing phase to improve the, the coherence of the result. Um, then we try to do uh, uh, an approach similar to the paper done by, uh, my, uh, by, by my supervisor, Takashi, who tried to find what is the main entry point for an attacker to reach a mobile user. Um, so we looked at two things. First of all, we, lo we looked at the, 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 the distribution between so the, the Chrome tabs and the, 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 yeah, the Chrome tabs and the custom tabs inside the data set. Um, for your information, unknown is when the mobile sensor was not able to collect what type of access has been made, basically, because as I said, it's relying on the accessibility service and it's not a perfect collection mean. Um, and you can see that while in the full data set, SMS links consist in less than 1% of the whole data set, if you look at malicious URLs in the data set, SMS links are much more prevalent 
and go up to more 11% of the malicious entries in the data set. Similarly, if you look at the type of, um, uh, of threats detected by Google self browsing you can see that um, in the web entries, um, the malware, um, the, 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 uh, sorry, the social engineering attacks in the web entries are the most common, while the SMS, uh, the, all the malicious links sent by SMS are actually mal uh, invitation uh, uh, requests to install malware applications. Um, in the data set, we only had like a few instances of unwanted software, uh, which, to be honest, like, when you look at the definition provided by Google, sounds a lot like social engineering, but for some reason they decided to keep, still keep it as a separate, uh, sorry, separate option. And, but the data set is small, so we didn't receive any threats by SMS, but definitely you can't just rule this possibility out because the data set is not big enough on that part. So as of the actual impact of attacks, <clears throat> what, what you can see here that this is a reconstructed session, which means that if we didn't reconstruct the data, a lot of entry would miss from that and you, you would not be able to get the full picture that I'm going to give you now. Basically, as you can see, first of all, this user received a link. We don't have the text, but it says probably something like, click on d-amazon.top. And if you look at uh, the timestamps, you can see that 17 seconds later, after receiving the SMS, he clicked on that link. At that time, for some reason, Google Self Browsing didn't, they didn't uh, classify this uh, URL as malicious. But as soon as this, this user starts browsing the website, all the entries are flagged by Google Self Browsing as malicious, specifically as social engineering attacks. And just so to give you a quick glance, so Amazon, Amazon login.php, which is super suspicious from a security point of view because like it's, Amazon doesn't use this kind of technology uh, anymore, but fair enough. Then you have um, update billing. So now you are, going, you are in a bad place right now, definitely. Like when you go to update billing, the, you are going to leak a lot of information and it doesn't fail because, oh, we go back to logging again, maybe some error or some redirection, that, that we can't say. But then login PHP ID, so you provide the ID of the user and update your card, card.php. Now you have the jackpot of the social engineering attacks. Like it's, it seems quite clear that the user has leaked probably his Amazon logins, his Amazon credentials, and his credit, his credit card information. To be fair, we didn't assume that this person was a trained cybersecurity expert just having fun with a social engineering attack. That he, I wouldn't do that because you don't know what kind of Trojan horse you're going to get just by accessing the website. So the assumption was someone got pounded in, uh, in this attack. That was our assumption. We didn't assume that every user was a cybersecurity expert. Then. Another type of attack, or more like not attack actually, is the antivirus. Basically, as you can see, <clears throat> the user uh, access something called a lekutan. So this is typically Japanese, I'm going to, to, to tell you. There is a very famous website called Rakuten, which is uh, a Japanese Amazon kind of mobile provider. You can buy stuff on it and stuff like that. So Rakuten is just an anagram of this website. So Rakuten. I'm going to frame in French because English. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I, I, I would have bet it was only for Japan. So, Rakuten, Rakuten is just an anagram of the website. So, so it's Tipo Squatting 101, basically. And as you can see, as soon as you start, he starts broadening. So, um, you have a dot top TLD, then a top a dot Asia. And Instantly, you have some redirection to a local host uh, web page, and KIS for information is Cas the Casper's Casper's key. Sorry, Casper's key antivirus that did some redirection. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's super small, but basically you have been redirected to blocked.html and permission denied.html. Even though we don't have the graphic page, I mean we don't have the end result. Like you can see that as soon as the user tried to access malicious content, it has been 
redirected to some localhost page probably saying that you are going to access a malicious website, we blocked that for you, something like that. So this way, with the reconstruction of the data, we can show that we have been able to avoid uh, a malicious uh, a social engineering attack. Uh, then another one. Um, so the last, imp the last type of attacks we wanted to show is if you receive a malicious uh, SMS, with a malicious link inviting you to install malware, do, can we find proof in the data set that someone did it? So basically what I did is try to match <clears throat> SMS links containing uh, um, malware and social like malicious uh, threats inside the link and try to match them with installations of apps. Uh, this, basically this was, hand, uh, this was done manually because basically I just tried to find a small delta of time to check because uh, the wider you do it, actually you have a lot of installation of packages that is done without your knowledge. I think it just updates and stuff like that. But when you look in the data set, you see like there are so many installations that they are not done manually by the user. So you have to filter out a bit. And what I have found is that if you look at the package's name, like they look low, they look like nothing, you know. Every time you install some Facebook package or whatever, it's like com.facebook, dot blah blah dot blah blah. The words make sense in the package name. Here it's just random um uh random uh, letters concatenated together. And when I try to find information on the web related to those packages, uh if my memory serves right, there either no information about those packages or some uh, various total reports saying, oh, this comes from a malicious session, uh, malicious campaign that was run, and those, this was some information provided by an external user. So right now, what we have done is to, we, we took a, a raw data set, tried to reconstruct it in order to have a web browsing session that we could further analyze, we have evaluated the, um, the quality of the reconstruction. Um, I didn't tell you the number, sorry. Um, the quality of the reconstruction was 95%, which means that the, mo the, my, the, 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 the model, uh, the algorithm I designed to reconstruct the session had an accuracy of 95%. And um, then I have, I've shown you that the reconstructed data could be used to highlight security incidents that have occurred on mobile phone users, uh, on the on the my, mobile phone of users. Uh, as a future work, there are a few things um, uh, we are considering. First of all, um, we could improve the current analysis because right now uh, a lot of it was done manually by myself, trying to find patterns and insights in the data we had collected. So we could automatize that. Um, we, could, we didn't use the foreground app switching, which means which app was in the foreground uh, was on the uh, visible on the phone when some security incident occurred, because we could try to find maybe malicious apps uh, patterns inside it. Um, we could also do some feature extraction to use the full data set instead of relying on a few hand selected features that I used for the reconstruction and the evaluation. And um, also, so similarly to the work I uh, presented in the related work, we could try to construct graphs of domains that lead toward malicious domains. What the work done by my boss was to actually cut, filter the, 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 the user accesses before actually reaching a malicious domain, but saying that if you go there, you have a high chance of being redirected to a malicious domain. So it's better to cut you off before that. And their results show that they could beat a lot of blacklists in terms of filtering out. Um, so thank you very much for your attendance. Do you have any questions? <laughs>